Welcome to our true crime series, Criminality Co., where we delve into the chilling world of real-life mysteries. In this episode, we uncover the harrowing story of John George Hay, better known as the Acid Bath Murderer. Through meticulous research and relying on credible sources, we present to you the true and horrifying account of Hay's crimes. Viewer discretion is advised. John George Hay was born in 1909 in England and raised in a village in West Riding of Yorkshire. At 21, his crime started small, starting with him being fired from a job doing insurance and advertising, for being suspected of stealing from a cash box. After being fired, he worked his way up to forging car documents. Eventually, at the age of 25, Hay married 23-year-old Beatrice Betty Hamer. Soon after, Hay's fraudulent ways caught up with him, and he was jailed shortly after being married, and just as it seemed things couldn't get worse, Hay's wife gave birth to his daughter while he was jailed, and gave the child up for adoption and left him while he was still jailed for fraud. His family had ostracized him as well at this point. Not long after Hay's release from jail, he moved to London in 1936, and continued on with his fraudulent ways which proceeded to land him in prison multiple times from 1936 up until 1943, when he was released from prison and became an accountant with an engineering firm. All the while, Hay had regretted leaving victims alive to accuse him, and became intrigued by French murderer Alexander Serret, who had disposed of bodies using sulfuric acid. Soon after his release from prison, Hay bumped into a former employer, William McSwan, in a Kensington pub. McSwan then introduced Hay to his parents, who McSwan worked for by managing their London properties. Hay became very envious of McSwan and his lifestyle, and on September 6, 1944, McSwan disappeared. Hay later admitted he had lured McSwan into a basement on Gloucester Road, hit him over the head with a lead pipe, and then put his body in a 40-gallon drum, filled with concentrated sulfuric acid. Around two days after putting McSwan's body in the drum, Hay returned to find that his body had mostly dissolved, and emptied the drum into a manhole. Hay then told McSwan's parents that he had gone up to Scotland to avoid being drafted into the military, and began to actually take over his lifestyle. He began living in McSwan's home, and even going as far as collecting the rent from McSwan's parents, and eventually, as the war grew towards an end they grew curious of where their son was. On July 2, 1945, he lured them into the same basement on Gloucester Road, where they both suffered the same fate as their son. Hayes then stole McSwan's pension checks and sold his parents' properties, for around £8,000, and moved into a hotel in Kensington. In 1947, Hayes was running short on money, and with a gambling addiction, he needed money quick, so he began to formulate a plan for his next two victims, Archibald Henderson and his wife Rose. On February 12th, 1948, he drove Archibald Henderson to his workshop on the pretext of showing him an invention. When they arrived, Hay shot Henderson in the head with a revolver he had previously stolen from Archibald himself. Hay then lured Rose Henderson to the workshop, claiming that her husband had fallen ill, where she was shot as well. Hayes then loaded both of their bodies into two barrels of sulfuric acid he had previously moved there. After, he forged a letter with their signatures, and sold their possessions for £8,000, except their cat and dog, which he kept. His last victim was Olive Duran Deacon, a 69-year-old widow of a solicitor and fellow resident of the hotel that Hayes resided in. Hay by then was all but screaming from the rooftops about himself being an accomplished engineer, and Olive mentioned an idea to Hayes that she had about artificial fingernails. He then invited her down to the Leopold Road workshop on February 18, 1949. Once inside, he shot Olive in the back of the neck with the same 38 caliber whiskey revolver that was stolen from Archibald Henderson. After ending Olive's life, he stripped her of her valuables, including a Persian lamb coat, and loaded her into a barrel filled with acid. Not long after, about two days later, Constance Lance, Olive's friend, reported her missing detectives had been growing suspicious of John Hay, and soon discovered his record of theft and fraud, which prompted them to search his workshop. During the investigation, authorities made significant discoveries linking John George Hay to his victims. 
They found an attaché case belonging to Hay, which contained a dry cleaner's receipt for Olive Duran Deacon's coat, as well as papers referencing the Hendersons and McSwans. Interestingly, Hay's rented workshop in Sussex did not have a floor drain, unlike his previous workshop in Gloucester Road, London. To dispose of the remains, Hay resorted to pouring the corrosive liquid onto a rubble pile at the rear of the property. When pathologist Keith Simpson examined the area, he made chilling findings. A staggering 28 pounds of human body fat, part of a human foot, human gallstones, and a section of a denture were recovered. During the subsequent trial, the denture was positively identified by Olive Duran Deacon's dentist, further implicating Hay in his gruesome crimes. These discoveries provided crucial evidence in unraveling the extent of Hay's atrocities and painting a clearer picture of the horrors he had inflicted upon his victims. Subsequently, Hay admitted to the murders of Olive Duran Deacon, the McSwans, and the Hendersons. Shockingly, he also claimed responsibility for the deaths of three additional individuals, a young man named Max, a girl from Eastbourne, and a woman from Hammersmith. However, these assertions lacked substantiation, and no concrete evidence could be found to support his claims. To summarize the conclusion of the chilling tale of John George Hay, his trial took place at Lewis Assizes, and evidence from the proceedings is now preserved in the Crime Museum at New Scotland Yard. Hay, in a desperate attempt to escape justice, pleaded insanity, claiming he had consumed the blood of his victims. He attributed his gruesome dreams and fascination with blood to his childhood experiences. During the trial, the prosecution, led by the Attorney General Sir Hartley Shawcross, vehemently challenged Hay's defense of insanity, arguing that he had acted with premeditated malice. The defense, represented by Sir David Maxwell Fife, called upon witnesses, including Henry Yellow Lees, who highlighted Hay's callous and indifferent nature towards the crimes he freely admitted to committing. Despite Hay's misguided belief that the absence of the victim's bodies would prevent a murder conviction, the jury swiftly found him guilty. Justice Humphreys sentenced Hay to death. On August 10, 1949, executioner Albert Pierpoint carried out the sentence, hanging Hay for his heinous crimes. The case captivated the public and received extensive media coverage, even though Hay's guilt was never in question. Sylvester Bolum, the editor of the Daily Mirror, faced consequences for contempt of court after referring to Hay as a murderer while the trial was ongoing, resulting in a three-month prison term. The tale of John George Hay stands as a haunting reminder of the depths of human darkness and the importance of justice. May we never forget the innocent lives that were tragically taken, and may their memory serve as a constant reminder to seek justice and confront the darkest aspects of the human psyche. If you found this video informative and intriguing, make sure to subscribe to our channel and hit the notification bell to stay updated on our latest uploads. Thank you for watching, and remember to always seek the truth in the darkness.